Good afternoon uh, here in Leiden and uh, welcome. Um, and welcome, uh, Professor Rohan D'Souza. Welcome, Rohan. It's uh, wonderful to have you here uh, face to face in our conference room here in Leiden, but we have an audience also online. In fact, um, we are, uh, there's two networks, the Urban Knowledge Network Asia and the River Cities Network that we've invited uh, to, to hear you talk. And I'm just going to introduce you uh, briefly, and then you'll have 45 minutes, uh, let's say, to, to right. give your talk, and then there will be ample time for Q&A, uh, both uh, people in the, in the room here in Leiden and uh, online. So it's uh, our honor to welcome Professor Rowan de Souza, who's with the Graduate School in, Professor at the Graduate School in Asia and Africa Area Studies at Kyoto University in Japan, currently doing a whirlwind tour of the United States and Europe, and we're, we're happy, we're lucky to have uh, <laughs> cornered you for this talk today. Um, so Professor D'Souza has his PhD from uh, JNU in, in Delhi. He's the author of, well, I would say a number of works, but among them is The Drowned in Dam, Colonial Capitalism and Flood Control in Eastern India from 2006, I believe. Um, and he has authored or edited a number of edited volumes in environmental history. Um, we know each other from a number of Urban Knowledge Network Asia activities that we did together in Shanghai, Northeast India, etc., etc. Um, and you were the General Secretary of the Students' Union at JNU yeah. in the last century. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well put, yeah. And maybe the last thing I'll say, because we have uh, colleagues here with the River Cities Network, is that you wrote a review of Dilip Dacunya's book, who you're going to reference today in the talk. Yeah. Uh, his book was Invention of Rivers, so that's quite interesting, and yeah. you wrote a review of this book about two years ago. Yeah. I think I'm going to leave it uh, Thank you, Juan. Uh, yeah. there, and yeah. you're going to talk uh, about, I think, a very interesting topic for those of us interested in water. There's a number of models about what to, how to deal with water in the city, uh, Chinese models, five cities, uh, there's the model uh, by the Cunha, among others, so yeah. so for Spanish. So yeah. you're going to tell us all about that, right. and we look forward to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that very generous introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, really, um, I I didn't. Uh, uh, this is my first time at Leiden, and it really meets all my expectations as a small uh, university town. Yeah, and. Um, I, I had a small walk as well, and I, I must say I'm, I'm just overwhelmed to be here. And so thank you, Paul, for actually fixing this meeting. Um, um, uh, you know, um, I was supposed to speak here at Delft, but uh, Paul said uh, that uh, he could uh, get me to speak here as well. So I'm here. The topic, I, I just want to focus a few a quick points on the topic. Uh, this really is a section of a larger project that I'm kind of bringing to fruition. And the section deals with uh, two philosophical disagreements, I would say, uh, sorry, philosophical di disagreements between two architect designers. Uh, one uh, uh, Indian, I would say in some senses, uh, but of course in the US, and uh, another uh, Kongyan Yu, who uh, is quite um, a celebrity of sorts in China. And, uh, it's not that they've engaged with each other, but I have read them uh, in a way, and I do think that at some point it's very important to understand their disagreements. Because at the heart of it, I think both of them deal with a very interesting question. And that question is of the monsoon city. And what do we mean by the monsoon city is something that I'm uh, going to try and um, uh, discuss. Uh, however, before I present, there's about five or six slides that try to establish the context of their uh, exchange yeah? or their writings. And so uh, much of the stuff I feel that um, you would be familiar with, but I'll just run through it to establish the larger context. So one of the issues that we are all aware of, uh, did this move? Okay. One minute. Uh, uh, this one. Yeah, this one, this one, this one. Oh, no. Okay, that, that's yeah, okay. Sorry. Still. Oh, 
Okay, got it. Yeah. So um, um, uh, some of the stuff we are all familiar with, urbanization is picking up. And uh, there are many reports um, from international agencies like the World Bank or United Nations. Yeah, they, they, there'd be these reports that are available for anyone to access on the, on, on the, on the net. And uh, one of them, uh, for example, uh, says that, uh, I mean, one of them records that in 2021, 64% of China's population and 37% of India's population was living in urban areas, yeah? Uh, however, uh, that, that amounts to several millions, of course. Uh, but while we say that uh, there are definitional problems, how India defines what is urban and how China defines what is urban. So I, I don't really want to, um, get into those definitional issues, but just uh, indicate the broad trend that people are moving to cities and that uh, much of the rural areas are being abandoned, especially by the young. And uh, so what we are actually getting is, um, uh, you know, statistics that suggest that the percentage of people moving to urban areas is, uh, I would say, uh, rapidly increasing. And so, Concomitant with that is the uh, the pressures that urban cities are going to face, and uh, there's there should be a, obviously a conversation about with with the increase in numbers, uh, will the cities be the same as they have been? Yeah, um, and can they continue with their services uh, with with these increased amounts of uh, people? Like if you look at one of those reports, the World Bank report, uh, there's a steady increase in China. Uh, it's now almost 800 million, uh, closer to 900 million people uh, who are now inhabiting what are called urban spaces. Um, India, similarly, um, you, you keep seeing this jump. Uh, uh, in 1901, you had 26 million people or 11% lived uh, in urban areas. Uh, that went up to 28.53% uh, uh, in 2001. Um, and in 2022, you had um, uh, almost uh, in a decade, in 10 years, you had from 391 million to 493 million people in cities itself. Yeah. So something's happening here where the cities are becoming attractive spaces uh, that are uh, bringing in people from mostly rural areas. And so the question <clears throat> that I kind of wanted to ask is if we have to unpack some of the history of how these cities emerged. And um, it's, it's important to know that many of the big cities in India uh, today and China as well are really products of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, the 19th century is interesting because the stimulus uh, for these big cities comes from the fact that they became port cities, not monsoon cities, but port cities. And there's a famous uh, quip that, you know, capitalism came on ships and therefore large number of, uh, I mean, driven by commerce and trade, that's the basis of how these cities got established. Um, and so if you see them location wise, uh, Kolkata for India, for example, Kolkata or Madras or, or what is now Chennai and Bombay, which has become Mumbai, uh, the colonial period really created and the context created these cities, yeah? And what, Ecologically speaking, that, that has meant is that these cities were really part of radical ecological transformations. Uh, that is to say, they emerged really in wetland ecologies. So marshes, swamps, and estuarine ecologies had to be transformed into hard land surfaces in order for these cities to be established. Yeah, And so... Uh, uh, really, the stories of many of these cities are about fishing villages becoming major cities. Yeah, and that's the that's something to um, understand politically, ecologically, and spatially and geographically. Uh, I just wanted to make that uh, underline uh, the the importance of of that transition. So it was not it was not cities in the hinterland uh, and simply built by commerce, but cities really grabbed from fishing communities made into hard uh, real estate places, yeah? And so even if one looks at Hong Kong or Shanghai, um, these are really fishing villages that become major cities, yeah? Um, real estate, uh, uh, right? Uh, so from fishing villages to port cities. So that's really the, uh, uh, the trajectory of the histories that one would be writing about. 
Uh, similar is the case with uh, Chennai, for example. If you look at the early uh, drawings of the city and now the, the contemporary skyline, yeah, you can, you can see the big, big uh, and incredible uh, shift. So um, uh, from fishing village to uh, modern city, that's the trajectory that I wanted to underline. And you know, I could I could go on and on. Like Mumbai also has has a very similar history, um, um, uh, and something that I will be uh, discussing. Um, so, uh, part of these histories are about drainage works, reclamation projects, uh, lots of dredging, yeah, along with the marginalization of fishing communities and their imaginations of of these these places. Uh, similar is the case with uh, uh, with um, Calcutta, another uh, estuarine, marsh, swamp ecology, now uh, transformed into uh, a big uh, city. And um, I should flag this uh, incredible works of, uh, say, uh, Devjani Bharacharya, who's written this book, Empire and Ecology, um, in the Bengal Delta, uh, 2018 where uh, she writes very uh, wonderfully about this transformation. She says, the transformation of floating watery soils into firm land, Bhattacharya argues, was principally an ideological project that was profoundly unwritten by the notion of landed property, which as a legal technology to demarcate land, marsh, accretion and water, actively triggered the clotting of Calcutta into urban soil. I mean, she captures that kind of whole movement. There's other works by uh, social anthropologists uh, like Chitra Venkat Ramani, uh, who also has got a fabulous paper on Mumbai and talks really about these transformations and these transitions. The notion of urban soil, uh, the emergence of real estate, the removal of swamps and marshes and estuaries. Yeah? Uh, now, this is the broader uh, ecological context and the histories that one can see uh, and understand about how these uh, transformations have taken place. But off late, uh, we have this notion of what we are increasingly calling the Anthropocene flood. Uh, uh, Anthropocene flood because um, the, uh, the precipitation is unprecedented. Uh, uh, huge amounts of rainfall in short periods of time. And there are, one can go through a huge list of such incidents, like just this year itself in Beijing, 2023. Again, Beijing is not a, uh, a hinterland, I mean, a port city, but nonetheless, just to underline uh, the kinds of pressures that fall on cities. So in August, this August, uh, 1.29 million city residents had been affected with 59,000 houses destroyed and another 147,000 civilly uh, damaged. 33 people died in Beijing with 18 others missing. Uh, but if you were to look at the devastation, it's quite horrific. Um, um, in fact, not only Beijing, but even the surrounding um, province of Hebei, for example, uh, uh, reported 10 dead, 18 missing, 1 million people affected. The direct economic loss was nearly 2.35 billion. So again, a shock flood event. Similar is the case with uh, Mumbai in 2005. Yeah? Again, a huge amount of precipitation, short periods of time. Uh, so the floods were caused by the eighth heaviest ever recorded 24 hour rainfall figure of 944 millimeters, that is 37.17 inches. Uh, uh, you know, the 650, uh, 644 millimeters was received within the 12 hour period between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. That's, that's a huge, it's like a, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 water that fell like a bomb, literally. Uh, similarly, one has uh, 2015 in Chennai, not to be forgotten, a huge um, um, uh, event, uh, uh, millions of losses for the uh, industrial economy in that region, uh, very well documented in the work of Karen Coelho. Uh, and what is interesting about Chennai is the Controller Auditor General's Office in India had actually used the word, this is a man-made flood, suggesting that it's not only a natural event, but something that's been deeply complicated by the way these cities have been built and that, uh, that there is no way for that water to escape. And many of the lakes and wetlands that historically soaked up that water or could have soaked up that water have disappeared and become real estate. And therefore the flooding impact has been uh, severe and, and uh, immense. But 
that's the quick context. And I'm sorry I ran this through because I, I suppose this is the kind of stories that you're familiar with. It's in this backdrop that we have two very interesting interventions. And this is really what I wanted to discuss today. Uh, one is by uh, Anuradha Mathur and Dilip Dakuna. Sadly, Anuradha Mathur is no more. Uh, but in 2009, they brought this book called Sok, which is available, uh, incidentally, on, uh, on Amazon. And you can buy, and I, and I did pick up a copy. And uh, this 2009 was a result of an exhibition that they held in Mumbai. I think between 2007 and 2009, they held this exhibition. Uh, and uh, I would explain why they used the exhibition format. And I'm comparing that, uh, and I, I must underline that uh, uh, Dakuna does not really, I mean, he does not see his work in contrast to uh, 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 Yu Kongyan or the reverse. I don't think they are in conversation or in any disagreement. This is a comparison that I'm making, yeah? Um, and, and I'm comparing to Kongyan Yu's work, uh, 2003. Now, uh, there's something to be said about Kongyan Yu. He's, he's really, um, an immense uh, figure uh, in China. He's uh, published uh, 20 books, 300 articles. He's on YouTube. So you can listen to many of his discussions and conversations. On uh, uh, He founded a company called Turinscape in 1998. And that company actually is now involved in 200 projects uh, across 200 different cities in China. Uh, he's got about... 600 or 500 specialists who work for him on the question of the notion of the spawn city. Yeah. And he's a, he's an indefatigable campaigner uh, and uh, someone who's uh, very passionate about how China should completely reorganize its entire cities. And he has traction amongst the Chinese ruling elites. This is not the case with Dakuna, who is someone who is uh, much more of an, I would say an academic presence and there's a reason uh, for this difference also, and I'll and I, and I try to explain that a bit. So uh, let me basically first explain uh, Kong Yan Yu's uh, philosophical approach towards sponsity, yeah? And his attitude towards what that means, yeah? So um, um, he, oh, oh, I did mention that he, uh, some of his projects are ongoing, like, uh, and they've won awards. Many of them have won awards, like the Hutan Park in Shanghai um, and uh, the other one in uh, Dafozi Park yeah, in Chongying City. Uh, both these projects have um, kind of elaborated um, some of his broad ideas about uh, what it means to be a spawn city. So the question I've, I've posed to uh, use writings, by the way, I should also add, and I'm going to go back a bit uh, if it if it'll go. I tried my level best to get this book called Letters to the Leaders of China, uh, Kong Yang Yu and the Future of the Chinese City. Impossible. I tried all as much as I could. For some reason, I could not get my hands on that book. Uh, but uh, there is another volume which is uh, edited by, um, by uh, William. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see the, it's, it's too small. But, um, but that volume has a... Uh, discussion of Kong Yan Yu's book uh, by many writers. Several writers take bits and pieces of uh, his letters to mayors and governors, and uh, they kind of elaborate his main contentions in, in the book. Okay, so I don't know how much this is a replacement to his original, but I've listened to several of his YouTube, YouTube talks and his uh, presentations in, in many places, and, they, and it seems a kind of uh, this book captures a lot of what he is being saying. So uh, let me get back to uh, the basic ideas. So you believes that there is there has been some deviation from the original goals of the communist revolution, okay? Uh, with the pursuit of Western style, car-based development, isolated residential skyscrapers and widespread environmental degradation. So he uh, draws out very clearly what he's opposing. Uh, in essence, um, Western style capitalism, and also a certain bourgeois Chinese sentiment. Uh, and he thinks that uh, critical of the imported Western ideas of development, architecture and landscape or bourgeois Chinese traditions, his core argument that uh, 
China has been mindlessly aping uh, Western development models and profit from these destructive approaches is fun fundamentally un-Chinese and certainly not communist. Okay, so he's got a very uh, a strong understanding of what he thinks uh, the uh, communist uh, tradition was about. Interestingly, uh, when the Chinese revolution happened, uh, uh, Kong Yan Yu's parents were um, selected out for being bourgeois. And he himself was sent to a uh, reformation camp, uh, to a village for about five years he spent, and which he considers as uh, deeply uh, informative and transformative of his approach. And that today he's his attitudes have been shaped by that experience of his, all right? And so what does he see to be the solution to this Western-led bourgeois thinking? Uh, dismissing both traditional Chinese gardens and ornamental urban uh, horticulture as expressions of little food. I should, I should underline, you know, he does think uh, that many of the bourgeois Chinese, uh, the mindset is that of, um, of ornamental gardens, gardens which have no use value. Uh, they are very, uh, they, they breed a certain sense of awe and uh, greatness and grandeur, but they have no uh, implication for the uh, for the city itself. Yeah, they don't they don't lead to any positive outcomes, and so he says that uh, um, the little foot is again a a term that refers to a fairly brutal and ugly tradition in China where women's feet were bent uh, because it was ex expected to, to, to mark beauty. So a lot of, uh, uh, especially elite Chinese women had, were sort of, were supposed to have little feet and walk like, um, you know, um, sorry, the, the elites uh, in some senses. So he feels that uh, that tradition is what this ornamental Chinese gardens actually amplify. And that we need the big foot uh, tradition of the of the Chinese uh, farmer, uh, especially the farming women. Yeah, and so uh, the virtues of big foot aesthetics rooted in the productive landscapes and cultural practices of ordinary people. That's his 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 uh, his uh, his claim. So he says, you offers a vision of beauty rooted in notions of productivity, both agricultural and ecological. Crop fields and rice paddies, wetlands and farm ponds, rivers and forests. These are landscapes that produce food, clean water, and habitats that can provide both cultural and ecological services. Against the tidy and the ornamental. So his opposition to the tidy and the ornamental, or what he calls the small foot thinking, is the big foot uh, thinking, which he celebrates the messy and the rustic. Vernacular, productive landscapes are crucial to his notion of cultural and ecological su survival. So he wants a peasant imagination in the city. He wants to get rid of Western mindset and he wants to get rid of bourgeois uh, Chinese thinking, which is ornamental in his opinion. Yeah? And so two ethical and symbolic concepts of nature and landscape are colliding. Uh, one of the writers, uh, Andre Stockman writes, the central government's belief that cities must be saved from backwards cultural values and made beautiful and modern. Uh, so, one of the problems that uh, you, uh, Kong Yan Yu has is that this imagination that the past was actually backward, the peasant was backward and culturally inadequate, yeah, and that you replace it with modernity and with the uh, you know the city of the Western values, yeah, and he says that uh, should is clashing with the traditional ethic of trying to work with nature maintain fragile ecosystems and seek safety and comfort in unstable terrain and difficult climates. So the peasant is someone who really innovative, adaptive, struggles against nature and makes it productive and beautiful. And from that uh, engagement emerges the virtue of actually aligning the city with needs uh, rather than ornamental thinking. So in the end, by integrating productive landscapes into urban situations, you and his team remind city dwellers of China's agricultural roots and reveal how rice paddies, for instance, can coexist with housing universities and other urban uses. So he wants really the city, the Western city, to be uh, now reorganized as a Chinese village, roughly put, okay? So more wetlands, more paddies, uh, all kinds of... Um, uh, natural um, 
forests and so on and so forth. So the city itself becomes a productive landscape. Yeah, uh, And at the heart of a uh, of lot of this uh, thinking about uh, uh, Kong Yan Yu, and he's often called the uh, the Chinese version of the American Frederick Law Olmsted, who thought that cities should also have a lot of public goods, that everyone should have access. Everyone should be able to access parks. They should be able to access uh, beautiful forests. And uh, uh, Olmsted's most famous uh, is the, uh, the Central Park in New York City, where, you know, in the middle of, this, of New York City is this big park, sprawling park, and everyone should have equal access to it, rich or poor or whatever. Yeah? So Kong Yan Yu really takes this to a new kind of limit. For him, uh, restore the peasant, transform the city, free it of its Western uh, temperament, yeah? and uh, make it productive and uh, uh, rural in many ways. Yeah. Now, uh, Anuradha Mathur and Dilip uh, Dakuna, Sok, uh, has uh, very different premises. All right, uh, he's not he's not actually intervening at the level of policy. He's not intervening uh, with projects in different cities in India. Mostly comes from a strong uh, academic uh, position, and uh, his uh, approach uh, was of creating exhibitions. All right, that is to say, rather than intervene at the level of policy. Uh, Dakuna wanted us to uh, grasp through exhibitions uh, different imaginations of what the city could be. And he wants to, he seems to be wanting to unsettle the language itself, the concept itself, the categories itself of how we imagine and think modern cities. All right. So it's a it's a it's a deeper turn of the knife, so to speak, at the at the at the city. And uh, in soap, there's a wonderful uh, uh, forward by Arjun Apadurai and Carol Breckenbridge. And they really summarize beautifully much of uh, Sok. Yeah? And so he, uh, at some level, he says that um, it is uh, a, a wetter, softer science of the city that Anuradha Mathur uh, and Dilida Kuna seem to be advancing a wetter, softer science of the city. And they are pursuing at heart a new visualization. This is not actually problem solving or intervention, but really a kind of uh, transformation at the level of imagination. That's what uh, Anuradha and Dilip, Mathur, uh, Dilip Dakuna and Anuradha Mathur seem to be pursuing. So he says, and at the, at the core of their effort is this argument that Mumbai is not just an estuary, but an estuary in a monsoon. Now, this is, uh, 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 actually, this unpacks uh, a lot of uh, thinking. Uh, for for the Kuna, um, the monsoon represents a rhythm. It represents a kind of dynamism. It is constantly shaping and altering uh, geography, space, and time. All right, and it's not to be simply seen as an event, but actually part of a very complex set of processes. So, it's an estuary that constantly is changing because of the monsoon itself. Yeah. And so um, they actually put Mumbai or the city of Bombay under a scanner. And uh, three, and, and this is how he, unlike uh, Kongan Yu, who looks at uh, in a broad sweep uh, the West or uh, Chinese, um, 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 ca you know, capitalism or whatever you want to call it, uh, um, uh, for, uh, for, um, uh, Dakuna, there's a uh, deeper layer of the crisis. And it starts with three centuries of efforts to create, clear, and, and institute permanent lines in a terrain that is forever on the move. As land meets sea and as saline water, uh, water meets fresh water in the estuary, the battle to contain, fix, and channel the flows of water in the estuary by the building of buns, walls, embankments, and the like. So one of his problems is that he says, you can't look at Mumbai without understanding that for three centuries, literally 300 years, uh, what is material, uh, that what is, what is an ecology on the move has been sought to be frozen and sought to be made permanent. Yeah, And uh, so um, uh, in the face of an aqueous terrain, aqueous terrain, which constantly defeats their material, materiality, that much of modern intervention 
has been going against the grain, against the logic itself of that ecology, right? And so his advice for planners and engineers, give up the illusion of permanence. Uh, if Mumbai's aqueous terrain is a constantly changing site of negotiations between land and sea, monsoon rains and shifting drainage gradients, design and, and plan like urban and, and design and planning like urban life itself must conform to the logic of negotiation, uncertainty, and fluidity. And I must say, when you read Dakuna, what is very interesting about the way he writes is he's always drawing contrasts. So instead of permanence, it's negotiation, it's fluidity and it is uncertainty. And so if you're looking for intervention, you're looking for uh, rethinking how Mumbai should look, then it's not looking to make it permanent, but looking to develop lines of negotiation, yeah. Um, so design in an estuary, particularly an estuary in the monsoon, solves the problem of flood control measures by making a place that is absorbent and resilient. Rather than flood control, make it absorbent and resilient, uh, the approach. So, uh, uh, you know, that is uh, Arjuna Padurai's and Breckenridge's understanding of soak. But if you were to look at how Dakuna puts it in his own language, the British saw the monsoon as a foul weather season. So fundamentally, they did not understand the monsoon itself. They saw it as an interruption, as a foul weather season an interference to trade and commerce, an impediment to the critical function of governance, such as surveying land and maintaining infrastructure and a spoiler in a sense. Yeah, uh, the cultivation of an attitude to terrain grounded in the belief that water and land are separable. And for much of Dakuna's writing, he sees this as a major uh, crisis of imagination where you treat water and land as separate domains rather than domains that are constantly interacting and shaping uh, worlds. A spirit predisposed to privileging land over water, firmly held property lines over open terrains, defined land uses over fluid occupancies. I mean, he ends up basically saying that uh, there is, uh, that, that to rescue the monsoon city is to understand it completely in contrast to what the surveyors and the, uh, and the, uh, and the uh, British uh, mindsets have been for that city, yeah? So uh, unlike deltas where rivers, now again, he makes another big distinction. Unlike deltas where rivers reach into the sea, estuaries, estuaries allow the sea in. The rise and fall of the sea is not restricted to a coastline, but is carried inland on a gradient that takes with it not just predictable tidal levels, but also the complexities of the world's oceans. So he says that, you know, you've misunderstood in a very profound way, the fact that in an estuary, it, it requires the sea in as much as then it expels it as part of a rhythm, yeah? And that rhythm set by the monsoon. Uh, the sea has been considered a permanent enemy while the monsoon is a seasonal opponent. That's the way he sums up the British imagination about Mumbai, yeah? The, the, the sea as a permanent enemy and the monsoon as a seasonal uh, opponent. Um, so, um, soak is an appreciation of aqueous terrain. It encourages designs that hold monsoon water rather than channel them out to sea that work with the gradient of an estuary. Yeah? Uh, soak is about making peace with the sea, about designing with the monsoon in an estuary. So he wants uh, this notion of soak, not simply about holding water or absorbing uh, water, but actually it must appreciate uh, the fact that this is an estuary in the monsoon. Yeah, And how exactly to, to negotiate that reality. So he has uh, three sections, which I'll just underline very quickly as to where this crisis not only emerges, but consolidates. Uh, the first he feels is that map making and city evolved together from the time that the Portuguese granted an aqueous terrain to the English on the basis of lines drawn on a piece of paper. Uh, you know, uh, my reading of the Kuna suggests that he almost seems to, uh, to argue that map making itself is part of the problem. That is, when you draw maps with permanent lines, you tend to want to get people to stick to those permanent lines. And that anytime you see movement, you see deviation. So in many ways, uh, this, this, I think, um, feeds into the fact that the Kuna 
really believes that it's a failure of imagination, not simply that of policy or that of intervention or uh, uh, that of property. That we we tend to see uh, cities as spaces of permanence when they're actually estuaries in a monsoon. Yeah. Uh, the second, it, it reveals a Mumbai created as much by the visualizing demands of the map as by the heroic efforts of land reclamation, harbor building, water supply schemes, and other grand projects. In a sense, for him, uh, that uh, it's the map that then actually provides a context for land reclamation projects and drainage schemes and so on and so forth. So it's not the reverse that you get the drainage schemes and the reclamations which are at fault, but really they are trying to stick to the map itself. Yeah, And so uh, this Mumbai has little room for fluid, fuzzy landscapes of the coast, like the mangrove swamps, which cannot be demarcated in a plan. The view from above, which is how maps depict the world. In many ways, I think uh, Dakuna uh, tries to underline repeatedly again and again, that actually map making itself of a fluid terrain might be problematic and might then shape a world in which we look for permanence. So the other two that he points out, one is landscapes that survive beyond the, he, he tracks for us, um, swamps and mangroves that have managed to survive the surveyors and how these, these fluid ecologies continue to haunt the project of permanence. Yeah, that's the second uh, point he makes. And the third, an artic articulation that makes depth critical to the fluid relation. Um, I mean, this is another point he makes. He, he suggests that if we want to think of a way to get out of Mumbai's current crisis, then it must appreciate depth. That is, there are different gradients at which uh, water comes in, comes out, uh, swarms function, uh, mangroves happen, yeah? And then unless depth is brought into the, the, the negotiation of this aqueous terrain, you are const constantly going to be harassed by flooding events and crisis and, of course, economic loss and death, yeah? Um, so, um, Mumbai's estuary does not lend itself to master planning. Unlike uh, Kongya and Yu, who thinks plans are crucial to how the city comes out of the Western uh, uh, mindset or bourgeois thinking, for uh, um, the Kuna, uh, master planning is not the way out, not the way out, because it involves too much of permanent planning. Yeah. Uh, so he says that um, master planning, which is a way of designing the future that takes the plan view of maps for granted and as such is predisposed towards the firmness of land and the controlling devices that come with it. Instead, Mumbai's estuary, however, does not work by probabilities and control as master plans do. Instead, it works by possibilities and resilience. So he's trying to throw new, new concepts that need to be uh, kind of reworked and rethought. Uh, so instead of possibilities, probabilities, and control, we need possibilities and resilience. So he tries to advocate uh, another way of thinking about this. But both of these uh, uh, imagination, both of these uh, critiques, both of these ways of thinking about uh, cities in China and India, uh, you will find uh, another very recent book by uh, Erika Geis, uh, the book um, is very interesting uh, because it talks about the slow water movement. And Guy's argument is that um, for about 200 years now, modern engineering has been about moving water quickly, like drainage, for example, pipes. Yeah. Uh, and what we actually need is a slow water movement, literally a sponge effect or a soak effect. Yeah. And um, um, uh, the slow water movement maintains that natural flows of water are inextricably embedded within ecological relationships. What is interesting about this book though, is that while she argues for restoring wetland ecologies, marshes, mires, estuaries, mud flats, mangroves, lagoons, and bogs, all which are considered, were considered actually as malarious and anti-modern city, uh, now arguing for them to be brought back, uh, Guy's book is interesting because it also argues that we need an entire range of biological life around them, whether it's otters, maybe snakes, lots of fish, uh, various kinds of insects, that 
All these are actually critical to making these ecologies work. It's not just that you would have a lake or a kind of a, or a set of, you know, um, um, still water in some places, but that uh, the city and the animal world will have to come together in a new compact where we coexist, uh, right? Uh, we don't eliminate uh, 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 the animal world. We don't remove it from the city, that they become part, not just as pets, but as wildlife. And there are many arguments in her book uh, to suggest that um, many of these species are critical for keeping these, um, uh, these uh, e uh, wetland ecologies viable. So uh, who's going to eat the mosquitoes? It's probably going to be fish, right? So fish populations will be important, yeah? Um, so there would be a way in which she's arguing for a new compact, not just between soaking and sponging, but a new compact between the city person, the urban dweller and the animal world, yeah? Or the wildlife, the world of wildlife. So uh, let me just put together this contrast, uh, which, uh, which again, um, as I said, is, is a contrast that I've kind of found. So uh, if you look at um, Soak, uh, it is really uh, about a visualization, a new imagination, thinking, uh, re reconsidering all the concepts, the categories, and the ways of thinking about uh, uh, cities, yeah? An imagination that thinks through the material substances and possibilities of nature. So Dakuna is very clued into what he means by estuary in a monsoon. Yeah, that dynamism and that relationship. Yeah, uh, uh, He upends the way we think about land, water, ecological relationships and aims to provide new concepts and categories to enable human possibility and creative, creativity. Defeats the hard separation of land and water by centering around the notion of the monsoon. So the monsoon itself, this great atmospheric ocean for Dakuna, uh, once you grasp it, you tend to alter your understanding of anything being permanent. So um, on the other hand, for Kong and Yu, uh, it's a kind of solutionism through policy. Yeah, uh, rooted in the notion of the Chinese peasant, practical and virtuous and sustainable. The hardworking peasant who really makes productivity and the natural world work for uh, for him, yeah, uh, committed to public goods that take on the neoliberal city model. Uh, he is for green projects against grey infrastructure. So grey infrastructure will be embankments, wires, dams, you know, flood control projects. But green infrastructure is something more absorptive, uh, like lakes, um, uh, uh, swamps, and the many of the lovely gardens that he's designed. Uh, a peasant's view of what the city must be: a productivist and sustainable landscape. That's Kong and you. Um, I should end with my last uh, slide, last two slides. So um, in September 2022, uh, I got a long response from Dakuna in an email, all of which I'm not sharing, but in which I, I asked him uh, uh, at a seminar that what he thought of Kong Yan Yu. And so I'm just going to read his reply uh, to me. So he says, when we did soak Mumbai in an estuary, we were not aware of any spawn city concept at the time. We place the past and the people in an estuary rather than on an island. That way we overthrew several colonial ideas grounded in an island city thinking and reading or just island thinking or just land thinking of Mumbai, which to us was Bombay, including ideas such as land reclamation, land uses, enclosed and containing spaces such as parks, etc. It also substituted spatial reading of the coast as a place between land and sea with a temporal reading of it between rain monsoon and tide. It all made room for a more broad-based understanding of local practices, species, operations, and so forth. Uh, so he's, he's not going to go for a master plan, but he wants a lot of local negotiations with different communities and localities. Yeah, And he wants them to kind of figure out uh, through different notions of depth and gradient how they should be dealing uh, with uh, their realities. Yeah. Uh, in light of this sponsity idea, I don't believe Kong Yan Yu is the first to put forth the idea, always comes across as inadequate. This is the first time I, you know, I think he's, he's writing on Kong Yan Yu. They are solution oriented, whereas our project are more imagination oriented. Okay. 
Uh, the latter, we feel, is more open to possibilities and goes beyond physical planning to include changes in other fields such as law, science, history, etc. It is also it also allows us to consider place without the dominating weight of the city and the urban which spawn city approaches to to do nothing to shake it off. Uh, what your understanding from Dakuna or what I can grasp from this, he's not comfortable with the idea of the city itself. He thinks the way you organize it as a space is problematic. And the only way to take it on is to upturn an entire imagination and upturn a, a slew of concepts and categories in law, science, etc., cetera, uh, that uh, push for permanence and push for a hard separation between land and water. Uh, and uh, only through uh, a, an imagine, a change of imagination uh, that actually one can begin to set out ways of going beyond the idea of the city itself. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think what he what he does feel about Kong and Yu is that Kong and Yu uh, doesn't want the city to go away. He just wants the peasants to take charge, the peasant imagination. Yeah, fill it with paddy fields, gardens, swamps, marshes, forests. Yeah, uh, grow stuff there. Yeah. And uh, just how a peasant makes use of a land, remove the on ornamental facade, remove that kind of bourgeois mentality, and also make it more accessible to as a public good. Yeah, uh, that's Kongyan Yu's imagination. For uh, Dakuna, uh, the idea of the city itself has to disappear because it might be premised too much, or the idea of the modern city itself must disappear because. It is premised too much on the separation between land and water. Yeah. So I should end here. Thank you very much for your patience. I hope it's not been more than 45 minutes. Yeah. Thanks.